All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of How to Invest in Commercial Real Estate. And we are missing Braden, yeah. so I'm doing the intro today. Uh, let's get a couple of updates out of the way. Uh, first, guys, we, uh, if you haven't seen it, we're closing on four uh, a portfolio of four gas stations in, in Texas uh, by the end of the mm -hmm. month. I yeah. think that equity raise is pretty much uh, completed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have interest, hit us up. Um, and then we went to Chicago this week. Brian, what were we looking at there? Yeah, yeah we were working, looking at a retail center there. It, there's probably a, a, a dozen tenants, maybe, I think. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, it, it ended up being a really good property, I felt like. It was in really good shape. We met the owner there. Uh, you could tell he was really conscientious about keeping up on the maintenance. Um, I, I really liked it. There was good vehicle counts in front. Um, the rents were probably market rents, maybe. Yeah, probably at market. You know, it was cool that the seller met us at the property, which I thought was interesting. And he wanted to show us all the, the ways that he takes care of that property. He was really proud of it. Uh, you know, the things that we like about it, uh, we are uh, 30,000 cars uh, right in front. You have a, a three-mile population that's through the roof there being in, in central Chicago. Uh, average household income uh, in a three-mile radius is 120000 um, You know, we one thing was interesting, they're all on modified gross leases, uh, which we don't prefer, but uh, they all have 5% annual compounding annual uh, rent growth. Every tenant... Yep. Every year, 5%. And that's not on the base rent. That's on the base and the triple nets because yeah. it's all in a modified gross lease. So yeah, we're nice. not sure if we'll close, but um, but uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, we probably, if we do buy that deal, we'll probably be, be launching it to investors middle of uh, November. Yeah. So, uh, But today we have uh, got an exciting guest. Uh, his name is Zach Leemaster. He is from Rent to Retirement uh, out of uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, did I get that right, Zach? That's right. We work all across the nation, but we live in the great state of Colorado and Denver. Well, great. Uh, so uh, tell our uh, listeners a little bit about how you got started in commercial real estate, and then we'll go into what you specialize in. Yeah, certainly. I'd be happy to. So uh, like many of us starting out, I have a background, nothing to do with real estate. I actually have a background in healthcare. My wife and I are both optometrists by education. Nice. I'm uh, from Wyoming, went to undergrad there, moved out to Oregon, went to grad school there. That's what, where I met my wife. She's Canadian. Um, and then I was on Air Force scholarship with the Air Force. So I was commissioned as a captain in the Air Force and served active duty for about seven years. And nice. that's where, yeah, that's where I started investing in real estate. I mean, I, I did all the things, listened to the podcast, read the Kiyosaki sagas and, oh, yeah. you know, all the things that kind of got me interested in real estate. I was always, I was always interested just to be smart with money. And I liked real estate because it was a tangible asset. But of course, being a um, active duty service member, I had access to the VA loan, uh, especially coming out of school. I was, I was still in debt. I didn't have a lot of capital. So I was able to buy a duplex with no money down, no PMI. Um, did the house hacking thing where I rented out half, lived in the other half. And I thought, wow, this is such a great concept because I'm living for free. I got to buy an asset, no money out of my pocket. That's appreciating the tenants cover my rent um, and just kind of fell in love with real estate from that aspect. And that was about 15 years ago. One thing I tell everyone, Joel and Brian, is that from that point, I've never stopped investing in real estate. So we bought the next year, I think we bought another single family and a duplex over pure rentals. And we just kept buying. And at that point, it was locally but I was stationed in North Dakota, not the most ideal investment market long no. term. It was good. It was good cash flow, okay, but it's not not a place that we you know saw a ton of appreciation. So my wife and I decided that we wanted to explore investing out of state, and that was kind of the impetus for rent to retirement. We we looked at different markets that were more conducive to our goals, areas where we saw better appreciation and rent growth and things like that. And then we started investing out of state. Actually, had a terrible experience investing out of state. Uh, to begin with, because we just kind of jumped into it. But we learned the process of how to identify markets throughout the country that fit our goals, you know, things to look at and analysis, and then eventually became successful out-of-state investors. And that really allowed us to grow our portfolio. We moved out to Colorado after I exited the Air Force, opened up our own private practices here, uh, and just continued to invest in real estate specifically, actually not even in Colorado, looking continually building and investing in these areas where we've established teams. And that allowed us over time to eventually replace our our income as, as docs and be full-time real estate investors. And that was the beginning of rent to retirement, which assist, we assist investors in investing across some of the best locations across the country where we help them do everything and handle everything for them so they don't have to build their own teams or manage from a distance because there was a lot of people that saw the success that we were having and approached us about, hey, we want to invest in real estate. We don't have the time, the energy, 
you know, our local market is too expensive, et cetera. So fast forward to where we're at today, you know, we do about a thousand doors annually. Most of those are built to rent single family and small multi. We do rehab some stuff across, but that's across 15 markets where, you know, we're handling everything for the investors. So that's my, that's my elevator pitch on our, our background and how I got started. I love it. Um, so you, you sound like you started around 2007. Is that about right? Let's see. I think our first duplex was 2019. That was when we bought that first, or I'm sorry, 2009. Nine. Yeah. That's oh, when nine. Okay. Duplex. Yeah. So actually, that's a great time yeah, that's to a good start. Time. Right after the crash, prices were cheap. And so, you know, uh, North Dakota didn't have a huge fluctuation, by the way. Oh, but yeah. yes, it was a good time to buy. But yeah, yeah. right. That, and that's when I got started, 2009. Yeah. So how long did it uh, take you, just for the advice to our listeners, from starting in real estate to being able to quit the day job, just for a time reference? Well, I probably could have quit much earlier uh, than, than we did because our income from rentals actually surpassed our professional income. I mean, that took probably about eight or nine years to get there. So, you know, it is quite possible. And we to to accomplish that it doesn't happen overnight but we consistently invested every single year we didn't make money on every deal right that that's real estate um but i look at it as different levels of financial independence uh the first level of, a lot of people maybe think about or strive for is like covering your expenses which at that point in time was maybe three to four thousand dollars per month and we accomplished that within like three three years i think mm -hmm. just buying rentals and then the next stage was replacing our income and then the next stage was where we're at now which is actually surpassing our income and being able to like create more of a lifestyle um, based based on our, our rental portfolio solely, not even our active business. But yeah, I mean, it took it took multiple years. Uh, and obviously, I went to school for eight years and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was a it was a tough mental transition for me to make fully leaving optometry. I mean, I cut back from like five days to four days to three days to two days and eventually just, you know, decided we still are licensed and we practice on a volunteer basis, but it was a transition over time. Sure. Now, it's so interesting. Uh, I think my transition from the first house to quitting the uh, engineering job was 10, 11 years mm -hmm. uh, was how long it took, took me. And I, I think I went through the same progression you did, where at first, when I first started, I wasn't making that much money. I was young and right out of college, I was making 50 grand a year. And I'm thinking, okay, I want to replace 50 grand. But then a, as you get some success, you're like, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to quit my day job with just 50 grand. And so you, you stay working a little longer, try to grow it uh, a bit more. And yeah, it wasn't until I was probably two or three times my annual salary where I was like, okay, I, I don't need the day job anymore, but it is a hard transition to, to kind of leave that behind. Yeah. Especially when you spend so much time, uh, at your profession, eight years of college, uh, it's hard to turn your back on it, which you haven't done completely. It sounds like, but it, it, it it's a difficult decision. I can see. Yeah. I never got into real estate thinking like, Hey, I hate my, I hate my job. I want to replace it. Or that was, that was actually never the goal. The goal was always, I just like real estate. I want to be smart with my assets. I like passive income. I mm -hmm. like the ability to use leverage. And we just liked investing and continued to invest and then roll our equity back into more investments and scale up over time. Um, and I think that's an important thing because there's a lot of people that get online and talk about, oh, quit your job and uh, X, Y, Z, you know, all these gurus online. And it's like, that's not necessarily the right choice for everyone, right? Like a lot of the investors you guys work with, I think, there is nothing wrong with having a really small portfolio or passively investing in real estate and diversifying your portfolio. It's not, you don't always have to be this person that leaves your job. There's a lot of people that approach me and they're like, oh, I'm glad that you found your, or realized that you didn't enjoy your profession or like found your passion or whatever. And I always correct them because we're very passionate about helping people see, sure. I enjoy that job. Now we have the ability though, to impact more people. We have global humanitarian efforts where we set up, set up uh, established cataract clinics all around the country or all around the U.S. or U.S. and, and internationally. Uh, and we're able to do that because real estate has provided us that. So, you know, I just wanted to mention that, too, because there's a lot of people that listen to the podcast. There's nothing wrong with having a small and mighty portfolio that serves like a diversi diversification or whatever it is for you individually. Yeah, I mean, there's certain day jobs that are really, really rewarding and very necessary for the public. And so I've, I've always been about uh, using real estate for, for freedom, mm -hmm. you know, time freedom, you know, money freedom. And, and so if you like your day job, great. Uh, real estate, you can still do it because everything that we built was done part time, just like you, you know, you're working. And so if I can build uh, if I can build it part time, then I can keep it part time if if I want. Um, yeah, now I've I've kind of you know transitioned out of the day job, but but I I didn't like my day job as much as some people like theirs. So, um, 
Well, let's see. We got a couple questions for you. We want to a little bit understand uh, 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 your situation. So go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So you, you talk a lot about uh, the the fact that Rent to Retirement is a turnkey investment company. You you touched on it a little bit, but if you could touch on that just a little bit more, what you're saying is uh, for people who are just starting out, perhaps or don't completely understand, you really cover everything for them, right? They you get them as an investor, and then you pretty much just do everything else. Is that right? Yeah, to a certain degree. Um, I think when we're defining turnkey, the first thing to understand is it's it's a buzzword. There's a lot of people that say and use the word turnkey and it's kind of illy defined. So I, I would like to define what we mean when we say turnkey. I mean, our mission statement is to make the best deals across the country accessible to everyone and have the systems and teams set up to handle everything for you. So you're not having to be an out-of-state manager or if we're in your local local market, even, even locally. But what we do is we first start with market analysis, just like you guys are looking out of state. You mentioned a couple early on about like markets you're identifying deals in. We do the same thing, right? We want to identify the geographic markets where we have landlord friendly legislation, low taxes, future population and economic growth, diversity of industries. We want to be below the median house price point, which is around 400,000 per single family. So we want to be areas where they have the largest tenant in home buyer demographics. Mm -hmm. And so we look at these things as far as well as like cash flow analysis to identify where the best opportunity is and then go and invest in those areas and build our local teams. So someone has the ability to look at a diversity of different markets and choose an investment with our guidance, um, helping them build out a strategic plan on where it makes the most sense for them to invest and where they're going to have the best return. So we do handle everything from, you know, either rehabbing or building the house Obviously, the market analysis I talked about, we have insurance agents and in, in lease. Um, we have the management component, which is obviously the biggest thing to ensure that the property is going to be successful. Over time, we have lenders that offer a whole variety of different loans. Um, so the goal is to have everything in one place be kind of a one-stop shop for that single family and small multifamily in markets that we know are going to be successful. And we have the whole gamut of investors. Yes, we certainly have the newer investor that you know, maybe wants a little bit of hand-holding where they want to avoid the, the common mistakes that many new investors do. We have the inv people that are living in expensive markets and can't access deals in their local market. Or maybe they're just, uh, you know, they enjoy their, their job, as you mentioned, Joel, and they just want to passively invest in real estate. We also have professional investors that are full-time investors and they're making good money, but they need to translate that into you know, assets easily and diversify across multiple markets and maybe take full advantage of the things like cost segregation and things like that. So we help them diversify and build their portfolio as well. So um, are you, you mentioned build to rent a few times. Uh, are you guys uh, building ground up uh, houses to rent, uh, multifamily, kind of what is the specific niche there? With our company, everything we do is single family and small multi. So that's okay. two to four units. And we like that because that is your like predictable real estate, right? That's your bread and butter residential real estate. And especially in the markets that have an undersupply of housing, which we focus on, which is mainly Midwest and Southeast. These are areas where we know confidently that these homes will have rental demand, stay rent. It's just really predictable, easy, safe real estate in my mind. And so that's like a good starting point. If you're under 10 or 20 doors, a lot of us start in that residential uh, sphere just like just like we did um, and then maybe trade up to multifamily commercial what what have you um, that's the majority of what we do but about 80 percent is built to rent these are new construction single family small multi in in different areas we don't do build to rent communities per se uh, it's mainly infill and we really do two things we uh, build houses ourselves uh, and we also partner with national and regional home builders like guys like dr horton lgi toll brothers where we work with their wholesale division and are able to actually come in and negotiate wholesale type of pricing because as a community, we're buying a large group of properties and we can pass those wholesale type of discounts on to individual investors like an institutional buyer would have access to. Nice. And we've really been a pioneer in this space because none of these builders have worked with individual buyers before. They've only worked with institutions and we've been able to kind of build that platform out over the past two to three years. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's super interesting to me um, buying houses. I mean, that is a very secure uh, form of real estate is, is a, let's say, a three bed, two bath, brand new home in a hot market. That's going to rent uh, every time. So, yeah. OK, um, another thing that I noticed that you put some emphasis on is uh, that are the tax advantages. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? You even go uh, as far to say that. Uh, you prefer the, or you put more emphasis on the tax advantages than you do the cash flow. 
Brian, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I can talk all day about this, guys. And this is um, there's two things that allowed that has allowed me to really like exponentially grow my wealth in real estate. Um, and the first one being obviously investing and trading up equity and reinvesting. Um, and the second big thing is is really the tax advantages. Once you fully understand the tax advantages of real estate, like there's no other asset class that comes close. And when you cut, when you add on the ability to leverage houses, it just multiplies that. That's how you get the snowball effect, right? So a lot of transition that our investors follow and myself included is I bought a lot of residential properties in good areas. Not all of them were, you know, performing assets. That's real estate. But generally speaking, I bought in good areas where homes appreciated. I either cash out, refinance those properties, or I sold them in 1031, exchange them, extremely powerful tax tool, right? So you don't have to pay capital gains. You can re-roll your money back into real estate. I was able to trade up. And as I told you guys earlier, now we own 11 commercial retail centers and some really high-end properties out here in Colorado. We were able to acquire those through just buying residential properties and letting those appreciate. And then the second thing is adding on things like accelerated depreciation because we're active investors. Our goal every year, I mean, we have a successful business, but our goal is to buy enough real estate every single year to accelerate the depreciation to offset all of our active income. And we've been able to successfully do that over the past four or five years. And that's that's impactful because that's millions of dollars of taxes that we would otherwise pay and never see again that we can actually reinvest to buy other assets that have additional tax benefits that we have a return on investment on, right? So coupling things like cost segregation and the 1031 going through those trade-ups over time, I mean, that's kind of like the golden ticket to wealth if you can accomplish it over time, right? I mean, paying less taxes is the best way to give yourself a raise. I mean, we're all going to pay a significant amount of taxes over time, but real estate offers the best tax advantages. And like I said, I could go on and on about that, but that's kind of like a broad picture of how we look at real estate. And we help individual investors. Um, I mean, there's, there's normal tax advantages just through owning real estate. I know you gentlemen would agree with me. Uh, the beautiful thing, let's say if you had $100,000 of, passive income from real estate, if you're leveraging those and buying them appropriately, that really should be minimal taxes on that or tax-free, we call it tax-free income, just through normal depreciation, your management, your taxes, your insurance, your your mortgage interest, all those things should offset your income. So that $100,000 of earned income that you actually receive from your rentals is really, depending on where you live, really the equivalent of $150,000, $180,000 of earned income, right? Like the taxes just work yep. to your advantage. But we help we help investors plan that out and maybe obtain REI pro status or do the short term loophole where they can do accelerated benefits because we have a lot of high income earners that invest with us. No, that's great. I've said it uh, before on this podcast. Uh, it's amazing how much time people will will take to try to reduce uh, their expenses in order to have more money, but they don't focus on the the single uh, biggest expense they'll have uh, over their lifetime, which is taxes. Yeah. And so I have friends that are, they're, you know, high income earners, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars a year. They're paying almost half of their income in taxes. And they're, and then when you talk to them, they're not, you know, they're not experts yeah. at, at taxes yeah. or at, at, you know, how the tax code works. And so I'm thinking, dude, you, you're paying 300,000 in taxes. You should be an expert at, at reducing that tax bill. It's yeah. the number one expense. All right. Well, so um, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, but I wanted to ask you just for our listeners sake, you know, is there uh, a goal kind of uh, rate of return that you're pitching to the investors or that the investors most commonly see uh, when they invest with you or on, uh, on behalf of you? Uh, just just so they, uh, our investors can kind of understand what you're returning. Certainly. So a, as typical investment as anywhere from that kind of two hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollar range. Again, we want to be below the median house price point and across the U.S. That's 400K. We're in up and coming areas. A lot of these are in the Southeast areas like Florida, Alabama, Texas, Georgia, Carolinas, we have the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri is as well that are lower price points like 150. But the average investment, you know, we're looking at a called 250 brand new construction house in a growing market that if you're leveraging using a conventional loan, you know, you're probably going to see an eight to 10% cash on cash return. Um, you know, that's, that's the typical standard deal. And these are quality properties in good neighborhoods. Now we have some unique things we also help investors do, for example, uh, we work with local credit unions that offer portfolio loans where people can buy properties with as little as 5% down. Uh, most people don't know that. They think they have to use a conventional loan. These are portfolio loans. Where you're, they're 30-year loans. You can buy up to five investment properties with as little as 5% down. There's no PMI. 
There's no prepayment penalty. And so when you look at creative things like that, where you're less money into the deal, like that's going to skyrocket your ROI. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's certain creative things we can work with individuals to, to do in that scenario. But yes, standard, standard deal. That's, that's kind of what you're looking at. So eight to 10% cash on cash, which we, we, we shoot for 10 to 12 on our commercial deals. So pretty similar. Uh, what type of, when you add in all the other benefits, paying off the mortgage, the appreciation of the, the property, uh, what kind of IRR can they expect over a five or 10 year period on some of this stuff? Yeah. In a growing market, man, I, you know, it's hard to speculate, but I think looking at historics, uh, you know, people can get up easily over 50%, right? I mean, if they're truly, if they're truly doing the thing, if, if, and this is where we look deep into the tax side, right? If you're taking that equity and re-rolling it in to properties, that's get That gets a little bit harder to translate and, and track on the IRR, but let's, let me just run through an example, a really simple example, hundred thousand dollar house, just for simplicity purposes, you put $20,000 down, call it cash flowing $4,000 annually. That's, that's a, well, that's a 20% return on investment. So it'd probably be slightly less than that, but let's say you you're paying down the mortgage, your tenants paying down the mortgage, you know, based on the amortization scale, $2,000 that first month, that's a 10% ROI. If they're uh, you know, you, the tax tax benefits from just normal depreciation that you would otherwise pay on your, your income, maybe there's a thousand to $2,000 savings there. That's a five to 10%, you know, and then um, just looking at appreciation over time, that's, that's also a little bit speculative, but even at a 5% appreciation, that hundred thousand dollar house goes up to $105,000. That's $5,000 of equity you created. That's why leverage yeah. is beautiful. That yeah. $5,000 divided by the $20,000 down, that's a 25% return. So my point is all these things add up and compound every single year, even if they, you have minimal appreciation, not you know, moderate cash flow. Um, it really depends on your exit strategy. That's the difference with, you know, individual properties because people can have different exit strategies, right? They could hold them for longer. They could sell them and reinvest the money. So, I mean, real estate's a beautiful thing, guys, and not no, getting it's... too deep into the weeds, but there's a lot of different exit strategies with it's single family. Super awesome. You know, we uh, we did a show, uh, listeners, you should go back and check it out, how to make 40% on your money. And it was just that exactly. It was adding the cash flow, the equity pay down, the appreciation, and the tax advantages, and you're easily over forty percent uh, a year on on a on a. We did a commercial deal, but but houses too. So, all right, uh, Zach, uh, is there a website that our listeners can go to check out what you've got going on? Yeah, we want to drive everyone to our homepage. That's renttoretirement.com. Renttoretirement.com. We got a ton of information at your disposal: investment calculators, market data, inventory, off-market deals that you can look at our YouTube channel and our podcast. You know, we have 160,000 followers or subscribers on our YouTube channel. We put out a ton of information um, to help you be a better investor out of state. And if you're listening to this in the car, you can text REI to 33777 to set up a time with our team and just talk about investing out of state. Nice. Man, I, I think this is super awesome. Uh, love what you're doing. Congrats on your success. Uh, everybody listening, go to renttoretirement.com and check it out. Uh, and maybe, uh, you know, investing in single family build to rent homes around the nation is just perfect for you. Zach, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We sincerely appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks. gentlemen. All right, thank you. All right, guys, until next time on how to invest in uh, commercial real estate.